This is the Sales Gravy Podcast. Hi, I'm Jeb Blunt, best-selling author of Fanatical Prospecting Objections, Sales EQ, and Inked, and I'm here to help you open more doors, close bigger deals, and rock your commission check. Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt Sr., and with me on this episode is my good friend Daniel Disney, who is the author of The Ultimate LinkedIn Sales Guide. It's a beautiful book, and we're going to be talking a lot about LinkedIn on this episode. But before we get started, you should go check out Sales Gravy University. There are salespeople who come from all over the globe to Sales Gravy University to upskill. In fact, they take a lot of Daniel's courses on Sales Gravy University. And if you want to take your very first course for free, if you've never been to Sales Gravy University, you can do it right now absolutely free by using the code free course. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. Daniel Disney. You've never been on the Sales Gravy podcast before, which is really shocking, but I'm so happy to have you here. People love the work that that you are doing around LinkedIn, and I've had a chance to watch you and your career grow over the last few years, and you've done a tremendous job of building out your business. So I've got a lot of questions about LinkedIn. It's uh, you know, something I think is on a lot of people's minds. I wrote about LinkedIn in Fanatical Prospecting, and I called it the greatest sales tool ever created, uh, along with the car, uh, Google, the internet, and the telephone. So I'd put LinkedIn in the middle of that. And you've mastered LinkedIn and you built courses around LinkedIn and built a whole business around teaching people how to use LinkedIn. So I guess let's start with the book it, itself, because it's been a runaway bestseller. Why this book? Why now? And why do you think people should read uh, the book that you wrote around LinkedIn? Uh, first of all, Jeb, thank you for a, a lovely introduction. I can't believe it's taken us this long to uh, record an episode, but I'm super excited to be here with you today. LinkedIn, as you say, is a huge opportunity for salespeople. The reason I wrote the book is because it's not easy. And a lot of salespeople, we're not, we're not born with the skills to use LinkedIn the same way. We're not necessarily born with the skills to pick up a phone and make cold calls. We need to learn. We need to practice. And what I wanted to create was a guide to LinkedIn that was written by a salesperson who has used LinkedIn for many years now and trying to, to master it as a sales tool. So I wanted to create a guide that was easy to follow that would take them through all the different, all the different areas of LinkedIn that they could pick it up and start to use it to, to properly sell no more spammy messages, no more terrible resharing company content, but going out there, finding the right people, sending good conversation, starting messages, building personal brands and just becoming better salespeople throughout the process. Well, I think that's one of the things that really defines your work is that you you have this unique way of making LinkedIn accessible to people. So when I watch your videos and I watch how you train people, you just dial it into something that's easy and authentic and uh and you you show people step by step how to do it, which I think you've done very well in the book. The question, though, I think for a lot of people is, is, you know, why isn't it so easy? Like it, it is really hard work for salespeople to lean into this particular tool to communicate, whether it's top of the funnel or whether you're 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 communicating with customers along the way or you're doing research or what have you. There's there's hard work involved in it. It is it is, it is a grind. Can you talk a little bit about that? And just let's take some of the I think some of the I call it shine, right? There's a lot of shine on LinkedIn. Like go you lose use LinkedIn and, and you'll get all your your sales dreams will come true. And then people start to get into it and they're like, man, this is hard work. It's hard work like anything. There are three common problems, Jeff. I think salespeople have and, and it's it's a really easy mistakes that people make. Number one, LinkedIn is like a marketing tool and salespeople need to learn a bit of marketing skills to use it effectively. So there's that part of it. The other part you've got is Salespeople tend to automatically sell. And with LinkedIn, especially, you need to sort of take a step back from selling. And it's more, not always a long game, but conversation, relationships, less pitch anyone and everyone that you can. The last bit, which a lot of people don't realize, we're so used to using social media in our personal lives. We use Facebook and Instagram. We're so used to using it for our personal lives. When we suddenly have to use social media professionally, it's strange. We don't know where to go with it. Do we use it the same way we use Facebook? Do we just go 
fully professional and then we're just sending out pitches and promoting our products and services. And so that's a very unique situation, all these things swirling around in salespeople's minds. And I think all I want to try and do is calm those voices, show them the right way to use it. Because as you say, when you get it, it's a very powerful tool, like any tool, like the phone, like email, like video, you know, once you understand it, once you know how to use it and you start practicing it and building it into your routine, it works. And LinkedIn is one of those tools. It's just about demystifying some of the confusions. And I, I love what you said. It's, you know, it's not about pitching. It's so, it's so much more about nuance. It's about building familiarity. And, and, and it is at once a marketing tool that allow salespeople to create awareness of who they are and their product and their service. And at the same time, it's, it's a direct engagement tool when you start thinking about LinkedIn direct messaging and the ability to have both asynchronous and synchronous conversations, because if someone's on their real time with you, the little green dots on their, you know, on their, on their, their window, then you could talk to them in real time. And there's, it's texting and email and video and voicemail all wrapped up into one not quite as powerful as WhatsApp in terms of the ability to use all those tools in, you know, as a, as a, like a pure communication tool, but it's getting close to that point. And, and I don't think salespeople always know where that line is drawn. And it, it is different. The things that you can, if I can hold you on, if I pick up the phone and call you prospecting, the things that I can get away with calling you up and interrupting your day will get me blocked on LinkedIn and I'll never have access to you again. And I think people don't get that and understand it. It's a much different type of engagement, which is fine because that channel was built for that type of engagement. It was. And sales has changed. The, the landscape has changed and people have different preferences, Jeb. And, and there are people that love the phone that they're, they're not on LinkedIn. They they don't use email. So picking up the phone and talking to them is the way to go. But there are a lot of people out there, a lot of decision makers all the way up to sea level that don't have time to answer calls. Their email is full up, but they do like to spend time. I've spoken to CEOs and founders that will spend hours on LinkedIn. That's how they like to communicate. And you're right. It's, it's a pathway that now exists that allows you to have conversations. It doesn't necessarily have some of the, the features that others do, but for some people that should direct route to them. If you use it the right way. Well, it, I think it's a good, a good chance is probably coming. I mean, right now you can make a phone call on Facebook messenger. I'd make video calls on Instagram. I surprised a kid the other day ago who said something nice to me about one of my books. And I just, I clicked the video. He was online. I could see. So I clicked the video and he answered the phone. He's in India and I'm on the other line, you know, where I'm on my phone on Instagram. And he was like, wow. Like, yeah, I mean, wait, I can talk to anybody in the weird world anytime, anyway. So it really is about having a conversation. I expect at some point that LinkedIn will build in those tools. I don't know how that's going to work, uh, but I expect that they will. I, I think the, my, my only real complaint about LinkedIn direct messenger more than anything is that LinkedIn is such a integral part of how people communicate these days. My LinkedIn inbox is separated from my email inbox. And I'm like so many other people, I run my life on my email inbox and I miss a lot of things on LinkedIn because it's so disconnected. And I would pay LinkedIn a monthly fee to be able to have my, you know, my Gmail and my LinkedIn connected so that I could just respond to people in real time the way that I do and on my email box. But I think that, you know, one of the things that you did last year at Outbound, and by the way, folks, Daniel's going to be back at Outbound this year, but he's going to be in the U.S. and he's going to be on the main stage. We're so happy to have him on, on board and you can go get tickets. This is a, a pure promotion, but you can go get tickets at outboundconference.com. And We'll be back in Atlanta in the fall of uh, of 2022. But last year you did something brilliant in your presentation. And what you did was you've probably seen these if, if you're if you're listening, you've seen these graphs uh, are, are mazes like, like kids have. So they'll they they'll have a little pad and there's all these mazes and they'll get their pencil and they have to go through the maze and get to the middle of the maze. So Daniel draws out this maze and what he does is he has email on one side and LinkedIn on the other and a telephone over here and you could put video or in person or what have you. And in the middle is the prospect and and his message, which was absolutely brilliant and right on the money, 
is that these days, like everybody has a way of communicating that they prefer. And in some cases, it's multiple ways. And by the way, you're interrupting people, whether you're doing on LinkedIn or you're doing it on the telephone or you're walking through the front door or you send them an email or you're sending them snail mail. I mean, it could be any of those things, but you're interrupting their day and you're among thousands of salespeople that are interrupting their day. So If you want to give yourself the highest probability of connecting with them, what you've got to begin thinking about is using all of those different channels in sequences with the right messaging so that you connect with the prospect at the right time in the right place with the right message. And my message to salespeople, Daniel, right now is that you have to be the master of all of them. You cannot be, well, I'm just really good on the phone, or you cannot be, I'm really good on email, or a lot of field salespeople who have struggled during the pandemic, you know, I'm really, really good in person. Uh, you are people who are out, social is the only way of doing things. If you choose one silo and you only do that, then you're going to, from a statistical standpoint, miss a lot of prospects. Plus, you miss the ability to build familiarity through all of those channels. And I'm going to throw one example at you, Daniel, and let you riff on this. But we, um, I had a sales rep who last winter uh, called me and she got me on telephone, did a really nice job. I, but I was like, I'm just not in the market for this. This is, I've already got a vendor. I'm happy. And we're really good. And I was, I was happy. Why, why would I change this? And she calls me again and leaves me a voicemail message. So I, I saw her name twice, sent me a note on LinkedIn, sent me a video on LinkedIn, started liking some of my things, started, you know, started liking my stuff on Instagram, which I, yeah, I spent a lot of time on Instagram. And, and then one day I got a package in the mail and it was, it was snail mail. And it was a really nice gift for my dog because she saw my dog on social media. And I picked up the phone and called her because I mean, she sent me something nice. I called her up and, and she said, listen, I know there's a way I can help you. And I said, I just don't think there's a way you can help me. She says, I know there's a way. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me go introduce you to the person on my team who was best able to make that decision. Cause it's not me. I, I don't really make decisions here. And she says, okay. So I took her into the, my CFO's office on speakerphone and, and said to my, my CFO, this is Ariana. Uh, you, I want you guys to talk, see if you can get together, see if there's something you can do. Two weeks later, we were doing business with her company, but it was, it, she used everything from email to video, to LinkedIn, to Instagram, to the telephone, to snail mail, to get in the door. And what I would tell you is that all of those things together, not a preferred communication channel, but it was the cumulative book of work that she did to get my attention that created the opportunity to do business with my company and unseat, by the way, a vendor that we've been doing business with for 10 years. That right there, Jeb, is sales right now. That is modern, digital, whatever you want to call it. That is what sales is right now. And I absolutely love that story. And I love that salesperson because that is where success lies for salespeople right now. And I couldn't agree more. It's not one or the other. It's not cold calling versus social selling. The smart, successful salespeople right now are using all these tools. They're using it to be persistent, but in a in a passionate, authentic way. This isn't about hounding you constantly until you take her call. It's because she, she genuinely believed she could help and she did what she had to do to get in front of you, to, to give you, to give to give her that opportunity. And I I love that story. That for me is that summarizes sales right now. Well, I I believe that right now, especially with what we've been through over the last couple of years is that I believe that persistence is a meta skill for salespeople. You know, Anthony Arino, who um, is my partner uh, with the outbound conference, uh, you know, he says, he says that persistence demonstrates to people that you care enough not to give up. Like you care about them and that you believe that it's you own getting and getting them to engage. Not, it's not the other way around. And, you know, I can think of like, I, I bought a really expensive piece of software. The rep left me 71 voicemails. Now it wasn't like every day I'm getting a stupid voicemail, but it was professional. It was authentic. And by the way, it was combined with email and a lot of LinkedIn work. And most of the LinkedIn work was just being present in my feed. Like it was, I would post something and and the person would say something genuinely nice about it. And, and there's, there's this level of, you know, of obligation you feel. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's the law or the rule of reciprocity, but when someone does something nice for you, you feel like you're going to get something back. And then, you know, one day he catches me at the right time and I'm like, okay, go. And then we're doing business together. So I think that that I think it does matter in today's world. And I think that 
we just have to blend and sequence all the channels. It's not one thing or the other. It's all of them together. And you have to master them all because people are communicating in all kinds of different ways. Let's go into LinkedIn for a second. So mastering LinkedIn. Let me throw this at you and let's talk about this. I'm going to throw a word and let you go. Consistency. (laughs) <laughs> the key is my re- response to that. Consistency is the key to to LinkedIn. I usually use the analogy of because um, LinkedIn is social networking. So if we think about face to face networking, we can think about outbound conference. Let's say you are smart. You buy your ticket to outbound conference. You go to this amazing room full of all these amazing people. But what you do is you go and stand in the corner of the room facing the walls and you say nothing. Are you going to generate a lot of business? No. Are you going to get your name out there? No. But if you go into that room and have conversations and build on those in a consistent way, that's how we create business. And that's what LinkedIn is. If you log into LinkedIn and you don't do anything every day, no one's going to know who you are. No one's going to know what you do. But when you start showing up consistently, when you turn away from that corner and start talking to people, whether it's engaging on their content, whether it's sending messages, whether it's sharing your own content, people see you. The more they see you, the more they get to know you. And the examples you've been sharing, Jeb, of some of the salespeople that have been, you know, trying to to sort of pitch you, consistency has been a big part of it. Every time you see their name writing a comment on one of your posts, each time it's embedding in you, you're remembering, you're recognizing that person. And People buy from people. What that does is it allows you to get to know them a little bit better each time it's building layer on layer on layer. And all of that has an impact. But consistency is key. Without consistency, you you won't notice them. You won't remember them. And it becomes a lot harder for that person to then ever get the opportunity to actually pitch you properly. Yeah, you know, and it's the the familiarity and so law of familiarity, but the f- familiarity leads to liking, right? So the more I see you, the more I'm, I'm I like you. It's like the first time you hear a song, you probably don't like the song very much, but after you've heard it a hundred times, you're singing it in the shower. That's kind of how that that works, along with creating this feeling of obligation. If I like something or share something, you know, we call it LCS here, but you know, like, comment, share. But if you like, comment and share something, then that creates a connection. You've done something that's kind for me or kind to me. And, you know, we're all, you know, we know all of the, you know, the hocus pocus around how we feel when people like things and they, you know, they share things. We're looking for that. It, it really pays off. But it, it's the consistency, though, that is the grind, because I just know for me like there and I have I have two people on my team who full time that is their job. Like they're they live on social media. I pay them to I tell them, you're the best job in the, in the world. I pay you to play on social media all day long. But I know that myself that I I sometimes am not consistent because it wears me out like I get so tired with it. I get so tired with trying to keep up with everything, watch everything, post the right things, be creative, make sure I'm liking other people's things that sometimes I just like, I just disappear from it and tell someone else handle it for me. And I'm curious from your standpoint, like for, for, and I'm a little bit different animal because I'm an author and I've got a lot of noise coming at me, but for, The, you know, the frontline sales representative, sales professional, account executive, SDR, uh, field sales rep, what, what do you recommend for creating a consistent, and you used this word earlier, routine on LinkedIn so that every single day you're doing a little bit of the work to, you know, to, to create that familiarity, to connect with people and to move the ball forward? Yeah, I guess there's two key things, Jeb. Number one is that routine. And the biggest thing I've been sort of trying to, uh, I, I guess, preach to salespeople the last few months, especially going into the new year is schedule time in your calendar for LinkedIn. Maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's an hour, but book it into your calendar, whether it's Google calendar, calendar outlook, whatever it is, create a meeting, make it recurring Monday to Friday at a certain time in your day, have time set aside for LinkedIn. Then within that time, break down those key activities you need to do that in itself will be a game changer because one of the biggest things, the biggest challenges of of consistency is remembering to do things. And if it's a new task you're trying to build into your routine, only when you repeat it consistently for a period of time, does it become 
habit. So by scheduling it into your calendar, and I usually suggest three months is a good starter block, book it in recurring three months. There it is every day. That reminder, that nudge is going to help you build that consistency and turn something new into, into a routine. And then again, within that time, it's about doing the right activities. What I will say, because as someone who's been consistent on LinkedIn every day for nearly seven to eight years now, I know Jeb, just how you feel where there are some days where there's just so much going through your head. You've got calls, you're delivering training, you're going to deliver a keynote, you've got writing to do. Where do you find that inspiration to, to write? One of the things that has helped me a lot is to at some point sort of prepare and plan content in advance and take a bit of a social break. Don't take a break so that you're not active. Schedule content in advance. So maybe it's a week, two weeks, you've got some posts scheduled using a bit of software, goes out for you. So from LinkedIn's perspective and your audience, you're there being consistent, but you can take a step back, take away some of that social pressure and refresh and recharge your social batteries. That's kind of what we have now. We have social media batteries and they do need recharging. The the biggest thing is If you can avoid it, try not to be totally absent from social media, because unfortunately, in the fast paced world that social media is taking a step back and taking a bit of absence can have a negative impact. So if you can schedule some content to go out to keep that consistency going, to keep the the drum beating, you can take a step back, refresh, come right back in and you should feel a lot better about it. Very good. I'm going to throw another word out for you. Curation. Talk about that. Curation is an interesting one. So I guess cre- curation uh, would, would reference you resharing other yeah. people's content. Well, which- you know, so you think about what wears you out, like what wears me out is having to create new content. Like that wears me out in my personal life, you know, and, and I'm like, you know, I know what I am. I, I'm an author. I'm in, at least in, in the sales world, I'm a face that people recognize. I'm the face of my company and not being there is a bad thing. So I, you know, all the computer things that come up, but man, sometimes like, it, like I just don't want to put my face on another video. I don't want to shoot another picture. I don't want to write anything quippy. And, and so, but I want to put, I want to put good content out, but I also don't want to just, and I do this, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I just don't want to post links blindly, which is what happens when I'm planning content out in the future. So I want to use other people's content like your content, but I don't kind of get credit for it. Right. So like, that's what I, that's what I consider to be curation, which is I don't have to work nearly as hard, but I still, it still makes me look good. So curation and you kind of alluding to the reality that Generally, curated content doesn't do as well on LinkedIn yeah. than created content, which a lot of people know, even though most marketing departments insist on salespeople constantly resharing really bad corporate content. I, I get what you're saying. It's it's not easy creating content on a consistent, daily, regular basis. What I would suggest, the biggest thing I realized quite early on on LinkedIn One of the keys to long-term success, so not just building a brand in a few months, becoming LinkedIn famous, but actually maintaining it for for several years, variety is really important. So with variety, it allows you the freedom to not have to constantly create the same type of content or the same level of content every single day. But what you can do is mix in on a weekly basis content that maybe does reference someone else's idea. Maybe, Jeb, you write a post about something we've talked about in this podcast and you can tag me in, you can write it nice and quickly pop a link into the full episode, but it's not curated in the same way of you just taking the link to the episode, popping it into LinkedIn and sharing it. You're adding a bit of thoughts, but it takes a lot of the heavy work away of you creating something totally new. One of the things um, that I'll add to this as well as another tip, because I, I get content fatigue, you know, having written every day for, for many years now, What I've started to do is be more aware of content opportunities around me. And I'll give you an example. Um, One of the gifts I got for Christmas this year was uh, Gordon Ramsay's autobiography, famous chef. Um, I know he's big in the U S as much as he is in, in the UK. And I'm sat this morning at home, just out in the garden, reading through first few chapters, read something that connected to me with, with sales. So there, and then in that moment, five minutes, I just shared, right. This is what Gordon Ramsay uh, said. This is how I think it connects to sales. 
quickly wrote a post about it. There was no stress. There was no pressure. I wasn't thinking about posting it, but it was just, I was ready to know that if something happened in my day that I could write about quite quickly, there becomes a piece of content. It's just trying to take some of those pressures away. Don't worry and stress about creating content, but be ready to to sort of see it when it comes. Yeah. I think that the, I think that, you know, curation is a big deal for salespeople. If, even if you're posting something from your company, the ability to write a quick line about it or give your thought or just give your opinion of it. I find that I'll read articles that are posted where there is a thought about it, or there's something written of the that introduces me to it that it'll catch my eye and I'll read it. And I like that. I, I like when people post links to things that are outside of LinkedIn, because it'll typically take me to other content that I wouldn't have normally seen. Now LinkedIn doesn't really like that. They prefer you to stay on the platform. So anything that's native to LinkedIn is going to get a, a, you know, a higher placement in the algorithm. But from, from my standpoint, I'm looking for those types of things and creating is a, go ahead. I was just going to jump in. Um, that's a good point. And one of the things that a lot of people, and I get people come to me with this all the time, it's that, Oh, if I share something that takes people outside of LinkedIn, it's not going to get as many views and likes. And, and there's one thing to realize with, with that. Don't, don't be sort of fearful in, in just chasing that engagement. You might get, a hundred likes on a photo you post one day, the next day you reshare a link to an article or a YouTube video. Um, and it only gets 10 likes. You might think, well, that's a failure. The reality that I often find, yes, you might get 10 likes, maybe a handful of people go and watch it, but because the quality of that content is good, because the relevance is so good. Sometimes you end up with better conversions. You can get a hundred likes on a random photo and get no opportunities, get no business or sales creation. You can get 10 likes and maybe three watches on a video, but because the content is better, because it's more relevant, that engagement actually creates a better opportunity. So it's, I think it's an important message for salespeople and, and certainly to demyth some of the, the, the sort of fears around curation. If I look at 2021, like the number one post I posted in 2021 was a picture of a puppy standing on the keyboard of my, of my computer. And I'm talking about total viral, like, you know, a hundred thousand people saw it. Did it do anything good for my business? Nope. I mean, but it was fun for my puppy. I mean, you know, he was a, suddenly a, a LinkedIn superstar and I, I've, I've over time disconnected myself from how many people like or look at something and, and just been more focused on being consistent with the content. And, and when we think about creation, like, I'm glad to hear you say that you get creative burnout. Cause I just get, I get, I mean, look, I was reading something yesterday and I thought this is a great quote. I need to put this on LinkedIn. And in the middle of it, I'm like, I'm just reading right now. I don't really want to stop what I'm doing and put on LinkedIn. Cause what happens is as soon as I open up the app, then I'm, then I watch, look at three more things. And that's what kind of wears you out. But I think, I do think you need to have that awareness. One of the problems for salespeople, and I think this is one of my big criticisms of a lot of, they say social selling gurus is they're like, well, every salesperson needs to be a blogger and every salesperson needs to be creating videos and every salesperson needs to be doing this and this and this. And the truth is, is that there are some companies you work for, you post it on LinkedIn, you're getting fired because they got a marketing <laughs> department and that is their job right now. We can argue that the marketing department's content is crap, but their job is to manage the brand. Like your job is to manage you. So what are some safe ways for salespeople to be creative, right? And post original content without getting outside, painting outside the lines that get them in trouble with their marketing teams. Now, if you work for a small company, you probably won't have this problem, but even sales gravy at this point, you know, we have 31 people working here now and we've had to get a little bit more dialed in around what people are allowed to post simply because like, I mean, I got a brand to protect. So, so but I do want my people posting and I do want them to be creative and I do want them to come up with fun things to get people to engage and, 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 and like see them as a person that's real, not just some person that's like posting corporate crap on. How do you advise salespeople in your training programs to be creative without getting burned out and keep it safe so that they don't get in trouble? Yeah. The important thing is to start slow and steady. Don't jump in trying to post every single day, because if you, 
you know, start from scratch and jump in the deep end, chances are you will struggle, potentially fail. So start slow and steady, one to two posts a week. What I will suggest for, for people, if you've got a company, that are a little bit resistant. And then Jeb, I have seen companies where it's in their contract of employment that they're not allowed to use LinkedIn. Like some companies get quite crazy about it. If you don't have the full support at the start, Try and do it in your own time. Maybe try and put a business case to say, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep it nice and simple. I want to show you the results. And if the results are positive, then perhaps we can get a bit more support and resources and invest a bit more time into it. Sometimes you just need to hold your leader's hand, manage up to some extent um, and sort of talk them through the early, early stages, but just take it slow and steady. A couple of posts um, every single week, start sending messages, start testing a few things out. Um, And if you need to do it in your own time, the best way you're going to win leadership approval is to show them results. If you can get to an end of a month and say, right, not only did I hit my target, but actually 10% this month came from LinkedIn compared to last month where 0% came from it, or maybe you overachieved and you can contribute some of that the numbers don't lie and it's probably the most convincing thing you can take to your managers to get them to give you a bit more leeway. Well, I will just add one of the points you, you mentioned um, just a second ago, Jeb was around that sometimes feeling of pressure. Oh, you need to create videos. You need to do this and all these gurus telling you, you need to do all these wonderful things. Most salespeople have some level of creativity in them. And most of them have some way of telling stories for some salespeople. They do it through video for others. Maybe they do it through written text. Others might do it through humor, uh, through music. And I think a key thing is find, find your voice takes time. might take a couple of months, but find your voice. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing do what connects with you, what you're passionate about, what you enjoy, because that will make your message 100 times more impactful than if you're just trying to copy what everyone else is doing. Yeah. One of the things that, that, uh, like I give, I've got a a client of mine um, that they sell machine tools and what they've done a really nice job of is the reps. Every time they do an installation, they do a create, create a video of installing the machine tool. I mean, what a great thing. They got a happy customer. It's unique. It's different. It's, it's, uh, if you like machine tools, it's kind of cool to watch. So that's, that's neat. I've got another client that they, the company really encourages their people to do service in the community. So a lot of their leaders are posting pictures of them delivering, you know, uh, food at a food bank or, or helping out, you know, a local charity. And I think that's a pretty good thing. I see leaders who, when they hire a new salesperson, they take a picture of the desk or they take a picture of the salesperson. When people get promoted, they make a big deal out of that. The, the, you know, the, I I love people who, you know, like they sell anything and this, you know, they're delivering the keys to whatever they sell to the the person. I think those are important things. I I think that we kind of overthink sometimes what creative looks like. I've, I've, you know, I've heard experts like telling salespeople they need to all have podcasts and and I've been podcasting for a long time. That's our, this is not an easy thing to do. And by the way, nobody's going to listen to your podcast. Like it takes a long time to get an audience. That's probably not the right thing for you to do, but it's much better. I think for people to see you and your colleagues having fun, see you delivering and taking care of customers, see you in an authentic you know, setting. That to me is like really easy for, for people to do because they're all carrying one of these in their pocket. And it's not a hard thing to create that, those, those moments. Um, even if it was you standing outside of your buildings and with a video, I love working here. And this is my, this, I'm, I'm so happy coming to work. I think that really resonates with people. It's not a hard thing to do. And, and it'll, like you said, it'll, it'll step you into creating some original content that will likely keep you inside the lines or you still have a a brand to protect. And, and, and as people start seeing that and they start seeing the authentic you that along with curated content helps create a body of work. Yeah. Jeff, I think we've discussed two things so far in this episode and there's a third thing, bring those three things together. And that should be your big strategy going into 2022 on on LinkedIn. So we've discussed consistency and the need and requirement to be consistent on LinkedIn. We've discussed variety. So the importance of sharing a variety of content, the final thing, which you're kind of just building in what you were just describing is the importance of balance between personal and professional. So when you get that balance, right, where you mix in, 
curating some content. You mix in sharing success stories and sharing your your wins and, and like you say, exchanging the keys or delivering a product or showing the, the process, but then mix that in as per your example, maybe a picture of your puppy, maybe a picture of you in the workplace. So people get to know you. If you can get that balance right, don't go too personal. We all see plenty of people on LinkedIn that maybe treat it a bit more like Facebook and it's all very personal might get a bit more engagement, but doesn't mean they're going to trust you enough to buy from you. Equally, don't go too professional. If you're only sharing corporate content, then people are going to struggle to engage with it. If you can get that balance right, consistency, variety, and balance, that creates a very effective strategy. And you just need to start off one to two times a week. Do that for a month, then add a a third in each week and just take it step by step. Don't look at the mountain thinking you need to sort of jump to the top, just take it step by step. But those three things, honestly, will have a huge impact. And it's not as complicated or stressful uh, as I think a lot of salespeople think. So we've got curating, we've got being consistent, we've got doing some creation, but LinkedIn ultimately is about connecting. I mean, it's about building out connections and there's some good behavior with connections or some bad behavior with connections. So one of my pet peeves is, um, is the LinkedIn connection bait and switch. So let's just say David over here is who is our producer. He's, he's chasing me as a prospect. So he sends me a LinkedIn connection request and it might say something like, Jeb, I read your book. It was really good. I'm probably going to accept you. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to go. Yep. It was, thank you for your note. And then the very next thing I get a, you know, an, an email from him that says, Hey, let's meet so I can show you my product. Like there wasn't, there was like, there was, it was hello, want to buy. And I find those things so off putting for me. And I'm a, like, I'm a stone cold, cold caller. Like I am a interrupt your day with the telephone, ask you for an appointment, but there is something about LinkedIn in particular that that particular behavior is such a turnoff. And, and I'm, I'm not like super sensitive to it, but it drives me nuts. I mean, like, like, couldn't you get to know me a little bit before you start pitching me on, on your product? So when it comes to connecting, let's, let's maybe, you know, end the podcast with some best practices, because right now, primarily, at least from my point of view, and you may have a different point of view, what I find to be the, the places where salespeople in particular seem to be failing is running massive campaigns where they're sending, you know, in-mail messages that are just generic messages over and over and over, just hoping someone will buy. That's no really no better than spam and email. Or they're sending connection request and and maybe they get it wrong on the connection request, but I rarely get like bad re- connection requests. I get the connection request and think, oh, I got a new connection, and then I get a pitch. And that to me is like the the biggest problem. But I'm 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 curious about best practices for making connection requests. And if maybe if you're seeing something different than I am on some of the bad practices right now that are giving salespeople a bad name on LinkedIn. No, Jeb, you're a hundred percent spot on with that. That is completely the wrong way to use LinkedIn. And as you will know, you wouldn't you wouldn't do a cold call like that. You wouldn't call up a prospect. I wouldn't call you up, Jeb, and say, Jeb, I love your book. This is what I'm selling, by the way. You don't jump straight in going off on topic. It's it's misleading. It's, it's not going to work. I think for me, the biggest thing that shows to me is what I call sales autopilot. It's that weird mode a lot of salespeople go into where all they think about is they have to sell something. They're thinking of numbers, targets, pressures. It kind of taps into the sell this pen mentality where they just want to describe the pen and Once you switch autopilot off and you focus more on each individual, that's where real selling happens. And for me, what I teach a lot in, in, with the LinkedIn training is the importance of hyper-personalization. And what I found myself and the companies I've worked with, the more you make your messaging about them, the more responses, conversions, and opportunities you're going to create. So don't jump straight in with a sales pitch. Don't you know lure them in with a subject line or a connection request and then jump straight in. You need to build some legwork first. You need to lay some foundations before. You need to earn that opportunity. That doesn't mean it's going to take you months. I mean, it can be done in it could be done in hours. It could be done in a few days, maybe even a, a few weeks. But you need to earn that right. 
then it can work. But I think when you kind of just mentioned it there, we are treading a very dangerous sort of um, place at the minute with software, with automation, with cadences, with all these things that are being pre-programmed and just spammed out this whole volume mentality to selling. And certainly with LinkedIn and from my experience, taking a step back and focusing more on quality is a, is a way more effective approach than this sort of spray and pray. It, it doesn't work. And if, if anyone has any success with it, you're talking minute, minute numbers for the, for most people, your best strategy is going to be treat each person individually, make your messaging as much about them as possible and earn the right to pitch. You are not entitled to pitch to people. You have to earn that right. Yeah. It's, I think if you're going to spam, you should probably keep it on email. I mean, I, I think email prospecting has taken a turn for the worse recently with all of the bots that are running it. Uh, but I do respond to email prospecting messages that I get are that are relevant to me and that are well thought out. And every once in a while, I'll, resp- I'll respond to someone who hits me up on LinkedIn. Again, I wish it was connected with my email box to be a lot easier, who has a relevant pitch for meeting with me. Um, I'm not so enamored by people who are just sending me links to stuff to read and things like that. It just is essentially a waste of my time. Uh, But I find that when, you know, when people send me a connection request and it's relevant to me or which is really easy with me because all you got to do is say, I read your book and it was awesome. And I'm pretty, (laughs) pretty much got me. I think that, I think that works really well. It's better if they've, like you said, earned the right. Like if I've seen their name several times and then it shows up as a connection request, even if there's not a note there, I'm much more likely to say, oh, I know this person and I'll save it. Now, one of the things that I recommend to salespeople is this, is that let's just say I have a meeting with Daniel and we have a Zoom meeting or we do it in person or it's by telephone. The moment that we meet the next, my next move is I send you a connection request because we just met. I'm most familiar at that moment. And that's when you're most likely to accept my connection request at that moment. And if I really want you to connect with me, then I'm going to build my case over a, you know, a series of touches for getting there. Uh, one thing before we go, and this is just a, you're, you're more intimately connected with LinkedIn and the way they're running things. How much longer are they going to allow companies to violate their terms and conditions and have these bots that are running these spam campaigns in, uh, in the LinkedIn inbox? I'm, I'm really like, I'm, I'm actually curious that, that they're, that they're allowing this to happen because up until like a couple of years ago, they were really protective of people scraping the site, doing anything and it seems like it's been like, it's like the wild, wild west right now on LinkedIn in terms of robots and programs that are, that are basically taking over the thing. It's an unfortunate situation because there are pros and cons. Now I, I agree, Jeff, like for most of the last several years, LinkedIn have been so protective over their, their data and API, no software could get into it. Now, the, there are pros to that in that you don't get the scraping and the, the mass spamming. They have started to open those doors, which the positive is we do get some really good software. And there's a lot of great software being developed that helps salespeople use LinkedIn, even what helps companies, marketing departments, everything get more from LinkedIn. That's the positive. The unfortunate negative is that there are then going to be um, you know companies that use it to, to their sort of advantage in a, in a negative way. LinkedIn are working on it. They're doing, you know, as much as they can. It's it's never easy for a tech company to fight off those things whilst also trying to build new features and enhance the platform. I think they will get it right. I mean, LinkedIn is still quite early when you look at other bigger platforms that have been doing it for a much longer time. Uh, you know, LinkedIn has Microsoft behind it. They're doing so much trying to integrate it with CRMs and build all these amazing sales features. So I think it will come. I think integrating it with email, creating a far better inbox built within LinkedIn as well. There are lots of things that we should see over the next year, but like most companies, they were dealt a bit of a strange hand with COVID. And so they've had to change some of their priorities. So hopefully as we go into 2022 and 2023, we'll see a lot less of the scraping and the the poor usage. Those places will soon be gone and we'll see even more great features added to to LinkedIn. I think that'll be a positive because I think that the, you know, the, the sales behaviors that you teach and talk about and the sales behaviors that I teach and talk about, those behaviors are best displayed when you're not having to fight with robots in order to get your message out. And so it'll, it'll force people 
to use the tool in a way that is constructive and uh, and and really enhances what we do as sales professionals versus right now what I see is and I hear it from CEOs, I hear it from executives that are getting really burned out right now because like I I've gotten to the point where I and I feel bad because there's so many messages in my inbox that I need to go to address, but I just ignore it because I'm, I'm so inundated that I can't keep up with everything that's happening. And in most of it, and I, when I say most 70% crap, just absolute yeah. pure crap. So something to keep in mind for salespeople is you got to be authentic. So Daniel, uh, tell people uh, a little bit about where they can find your book and hold it up again so we can all see it. Uh, if you're watching the uh -huh. video, you won't, you won't see this. You'll say the name of the book again and then where people can find you. Yeah. So the ultimate LinkedIn sales guide published by Wiley forward by Mr. Jeb Blunt yourself um, is available on Amazon uh, hardback and also Kindle. Um, you'll find me on LinkedIn, obviously Daniel Disney and my website is Daniel Disney dot online. Um, my passion as I hope everyone listening and watching will see is trying to help salespeople and sales teams get the most out of LinkedIn. Um, but Jeb, I've, I've loved this conversation. I think we've delved into some really good topics and heading into 2000. 22, hopefully equip salespeople with some skills, thoughts, and concepts that will help them get a little bit more from LinkedIn. And just a quick plug for Daniel. He is an excellent instructor. I, I've enjoyed watching his, uh, his videos and you can, you can go to his website and uh, he's, you've got great training there. And if you're, if you're on the Salesgrave University platform, we also have sales uh, Daniel there. So you can, you can go there as well. So we make it convenient for you to get Daniel everywhere. He's, he's amazing. So go get, pick up the book. And I did write the foreword. Wiley is our shared publisher. I love John Wiley and sons, a great business book publisher. And, and don't forget, if you want to take your very first course for free on Salesgravy University, just go to learn.salesgravy.com, excuse me, learn.salesgravy.com and use the coupon code free course. I'll see you next time on the Salesgravy podcast. 